Father, you forgive us all our sins, having cancelled the little people with its railways that was against us. Jesus took it away, nailing it to the cross, and had his arm the cross and the cross. He made public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. As we think of the sufferings of Jesus and meditate on his words, may we hate sin and live for him and his righteousness. In his name, Amen. Dear people of God, kindly be seated. Today we observe this day as Good Friday, and the theme for our meditation is Cross. Death of death, cross, death of death. Let us pray. Merciful God, who in your love for the whole creation conquered death by death and resurrection of your Son on the cross, thus redeemed the potter's field by the ransom of your Son, Jesus Christ, to find solace for the dead, redeem the oppressed. We realize our weaknesses. Awaken and enlighten us that we may find joy in practicing doing your will in our lives. In the name of God, who sent his Son to this world, the Christ who trampled death on the cross, and the Holy Spirit who continues to be a companion in our weaknesses, now and forever. Amen. The scripture portions will be read to us. The King of Heaven, who lived in the place, heard that Israel was coming by the way of He fought against Israel and took some of them captive. And Israel broke his bow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give this people into my hand, then I will devote their cities to destruction. And the Lord heeded the voice of Israel and gave over the Canaanites and they devoted them and their cities to destruction. So the name of the place was called Hamon. From Mount Har, they sent out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people become impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to, to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we look this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpent among the people, and they beat the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fairy serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a branch serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the branch serpent and live. Here ends the lesson of all glory to God above. Thank you.
The second lesson is from chapter 22 of the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear, and in the night season, and am not silent. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you, they trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot down the lip, they shake their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust one of my mother's best. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many evils have surrounded me, strong wounds of passion have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am pulled out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast rocks. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All your descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all your offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust shall bow before him, even he who cannot keep himself alive. A posterity shall serve him, it will be the counter of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born, that he has done this. Here is the lesson. This Ibsen lesson is taken from Apostle Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 15, reading from verse 50 to 58. First Corinthians, chapter 15, reading from verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of night, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, that 
we swallowed up in the victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brother, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Here is the lesson. Thanks be to God. The gospel portion of the university is Ms. B. Angulata Nedanalika we shall read from Matthew 27, 27 to 56. 27. The gospel reading is taken from. That is all right. Sir. The gospel reading is taken from Matthew chapter 27, verses 1 to 56. Matthew chapter 27, 1 to 20, 56. When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had born him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was morseful and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. Seeing, I have seen by betraying innocent men. And they said, What is that to us? You see it to pay. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. And they consulted together and brought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the value of him who was pierced, whom they of the children of Israel pierced, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, Is it? It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him, Not one word, so that the governor marveled a great greatly. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to pleasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And that at that time they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas, or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew not that they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife said to him, saying, I have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. Then the governor said, Why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that, he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was raising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see it to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, and when he had scrouged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. 
When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe of him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Now, as they came out, they found a man of Syrian, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgatha, that is to say, a place of skull, they gave him so wine, mingled with gall, to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put up over his head this accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, waving his their heads, and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in the three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him believed him with the same thing. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatan, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with the sour wine, and put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and he yielded up his spirit. Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn to two from top to bottom, and the earthquake and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there looking on far and from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Zebedee, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's son. Here ends the Gospel. Thank you, be seated. Dear people of God, as we meditate upon these words, cross, death of death, we come across an important hymn that is there in our hymn book. Hymn number 496, written by Charles Wesley. And that hymn conveys a very strong message to all of us as we embark on this meditation. It starts with this verse, And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? What a great theological hymn that he has written. This hymn, which was written in the 18th century, conveys the search of human mind and the very idea that humans, you know, have on this very special day of Good Friday. And can it be that I should gain? Yes, how can I gain an interest in the blood of Christ? And how do I look at the love of Christ? It is amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Yes, dear people of God, here in this particular hymn, Charles Wesley conveys a very strong message 
He tells us that we have different perspectives, different mindset, different understanding while looking at the cross of Christ. And when we look deeper into the truth of Christ, truth of the word of Christ, especially of the cross, it conveys amazing love. Yes, it is amazing love. Love for us. Love which God has. And that is why he says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal love, eternal life. Yes, dear people of God, this is the truth that is said in this particular hymn. And that is the wonderful way in which we come across death of death. Yes, dear people of God, we might question, as Job has rightly said in his book, how can humans who can die can live again? And how can people who always die, even we see the face of death, even till today, how do people understand the abolishment of death? But dear people of God, God talks about two particular deaths. One is physical death, which was brought by Adam. And the second one is spiritual death, which is in the hands of believers. If you willfully disobey the commandments of God, even though you are alive, you are dead in the sight of God. And that is what is said in the seven churches in the book of Revelation. He talks to one of the church and he says, even though you are alive, you are spiritually dead. And that is why death of death is, you know, the word of God clearly conveys that today on the cross, cross abolished death. And Jesus Christ through resurrection, he removed death, the spiritual death from all of us. And he abolished death from our lives. And today with grateful hearts, we sing this song, Amazing Love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Yes, dear people of God, we should approach these seven meditations, looking at the amazing love that God shows to us on this very special day of Good Friday. Let God help us and guide us in these seven meditations. Let us all join in singing Him. Forgive them, O my Father. We shall sing only the first two stanzas. Forgive them, O my Father. Jesus. 
A great number of people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never go, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. Here it is the reading. Let us pray. Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for this wonderful morning, giving us this wonderful time and opportunity on this very special day of Good Friday to gather together in your holy name and especially in your holy sanctuary. Lord, this time, even as we have read your word and even as we meditate upon your word, we pray that you would speak to us in Jesus' precious name, my name. Amen. Dear people of God, greetings to you in the most precious name of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I deem it a great privilege and honor to stand before you this day on this very special uh, day of Good Friday. Good Friday is very meaningful to all of us. Good Friday is very special. It is not Bad Friday, but it is Good Friday. Why do we say it is Good Friday? Even though our Lord and Savior died on the cross, it is our responsibility to understand that He died for our sins. There is a very special way of approaching these seven meditations. There is a special way of understanding these special meditations. There is a very spiritual encounter that a believer has on this very special day with their Savior, that is your own personal Savior, a personal connection with one-to-one, -one, a personal relationship with God, a personal encounter with God. And that is how we see in the entire Bible. You know, Moses prays to God in Exodus chapter 33, God, show me your face. This was the prayer, if you can carefully remember, this was the encounter with Moses had. You know, when he prayed to God, he wanted to see the glory of God. You know what God said in verse 19, he said, I will pass, my goodness will pass before you. I will proclaim the name Lord before you. I will be gracious and merciful to you. I will bless those who bless and I will be compassionate on those I think I will be compassionate on them. And ultimately he says on verse 20, you know, but you cannot see my face, for no one shall see and live. For no one shall see and live. He says, my glory passes by, and I will cover you by my hand. You shall see my back, not my face. God, you know, spoke to Moses, and he said to him, you can only see me in passion. Every Good Friday goes on like this in our life. You know, we only come to the church. We traditionally participate. We believe that it is a spiritual exercise that we often party. And without knowing what we have achieved through this Good Friday, we move back to our respective homes. What is Good Friday to us? What does it mean, Good Friday? Why do we celebrate? Why do we observe? Why do we party? Why do we fast? Dear people of God, Moses says, we need to see the face of God. We need to have a personal connection with God. We should understand the sacrifice which God has done for us. 
and that is the truth that we are going to learn. Martin Luther, while you know explaining this particular episode, he says it is theology of cross that we always look towards on Good Friday. We only see Jesus' back or partially we look at his sacrifice from a traditional perspective. But today we need to give freedom to the cross. We need to look at the cross. We need to give it freedom. It should speak to us. It cannot remain silent. It should speak to each one of us. It should transform our hearts. It should transform our minds. It should tell us what we are. Any word of God that does not point out our life is not a word of God. That is what scholars say. It always pokes at us. It pinches us. It points at us. And it questions our very identity. Today, you know, Martin Luther says, we should see theology of Christ. Theology of cross is nothing but seeing the face of Christ on the cross. What was cross? What was Christ doing on the cross? There was the crown of thorns on his head, and every part of his body was ailing. You know, every part of his body was bleeding, and every part of his skin was whipped, and it was wide open. And we do not see actually what really happened. But when the, you know, the things that were used to whip him, the whipper, you know, it almost took out the flesh. And literally we can see the bones of Jesus Christ that we have never seen in any pictures. So Martin Luther invites us to approach these seven words, you know, with that perspective, looking the real face of Christ, it should speak to us. The first word that we have, you know, uh, read about is, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Yes, dear people of God, this is very troubling word for all of us. Forgiveness is not a cup of tea for Christians, isn't it? Forgiveness is very difficult. Forgiveness is challenging. Forgiveness cannot be achieved by any Christian because we do not believe in forgiveness. We believe in retaliation. We believe in revenge. We believe in taking grudge. And we believe in speaking against everybody. How do we understand forgiveness? And whenever we listen to the word of God, forgiveness, what does it speak to us? It goes numb, isn't it? It is like a bouncer which goes beyond our heads. Forgiveness will never be understood by Christians who do not believe in forgiveness. And that is why here Anthony Bash, you know, writing about forgiveness and Christian ethics. Forgiveness in 21st century, you know, he speaks that forgiveness is the work of me. That is what people think. You know, when we forgive somebody, we believe that we are weak and we are powerless. That is why we, are, we tend to forgive others. The second thought is forgiveness is unwise un un and foolish. Only foolish people will forgive others. It is unwise to forgive others. It is a foolish act. And he says forgiveness for Christian understanding is God should forgive us, but we should never forgive others. Every Sunday we pray to God, forgive our sins as we forgive others. But our philosophy, our thought of thinking is different. God should forgive us, but we should not forgive others. We should remember their forgiveness. Forgive, but not forget. These are some of the terminologies that we play always when we talk about forgiveness. And Anthony Bash forgive, uh, further, he says that failure in realizing the wrong way, most of the time, people even don't understand that they have done something wrong. This is the most important aspect. That is why we do not understand the meaning of forgiveness. They do not understand that we have done something wrong. People do not have courage to say. They have courage to say something wrong against others. But they don't have courage to ask for forgiveness. And when we look at from this perspective, 
Forgiveness is, is an act of courage. Forgiveness cannot be an act of timidness. Forgiveness is an act of courageous person. And second thing which he says is, even though we speak with the wrong doer, we do not forgive them at heart, we forgive, but we will never forget. That is, you know, doing for an external perspective, doing or giving forgiveness to the others from an external perspective. Jesus Christ vehemently opposed the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. He called them brood of vipers. He called them, you know, you know, graves which are very white. He called them, you know, with various words. They are literally hypocrites. They do not do what is according to the word of God, but they follow the system of the world. They wanted to please people. They wanted to make people happy by following the language of the world. And that is why Jesus always opposed Pharisees this. He always said, you hypocrites, you brood of vipers, you are just like open graves. You are good looking from outside, but your hearts are filled with filthy things. Your hearts are filled with filthy things. You are not able to look at the true forgiveness. And that is why Jesus vehemently rejected them. And in a philosophical way and in a modern way, we say, if we forgive somebody, it will become a precedence, isn't it? That is also a danger. We say, if we forgive somebody, then the other person will think, whatever we can do with this person, it goes on. So forgiveness is also thought from a perspective where if you forgive, then it becomes a precedence. And sometimes, you know, we do not know who to forgive because there will be people working so meticulously behind doing wrong towards us that we do not know who is the person who has done wrong to us. You know, sometimes people carry caricature certain things. Sometimes people misinterpret certain things. Sometimes people, you know, speak certain things. And that is why the very idea of character assassination comes. We tell something about some person behind that person so that it becomes unverifiable. And ultimately, the person who is the victim there doesn't know who is the person who has done wrong to him or her. And that is why ultimately we do not forgive other people. Dear people of God, the first and foremost thing that we learn from this particular biblical lesson is forgiveness is a gift to the most undeserved person. Forgiveness is a gift to the most undeserved person. Jesus Christ has forgiven one of the most undeserving person is none other than Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was the most despised person. He was a tax collector. He could not stand in the midst of people. But Jesus saw him and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down. I am coming to your home and salvation has come to your home. He did not say to his father, he did not say to his mother, he did not say to his disciples, but he said to Zacchaeus, yes, dear people of God, forgiveness is given to the person as a gift to the undeserving person. Experience of forgiveness is a regeneration of transformation. Yes, dear people of God, forgiveness will become a starting point for the people to understand what really is wrong with them, isn't it? If people do not understand what they have done to you, you can start making them realize by forgiving them. By saying that you have forgiven them, that becomes the starting point for people to understand that there is something wrong in their lives. The episode of prodigal son is a wonderful episode where, you know, the re repentant son comes to the father and he repents. He does not come to the father as a son, but he comes to the father with repentance and he says to him, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I came to you as a servant. And that is how, you know, the father was so gracious enough to accept him as his own and he made him to be one among his son. And the third important aspect that we learn from this word is forgiveness leads to 
renewed relationships. Yes, dear people of God, we forgive and forget. No, dear people of God, that cannot work out in our life. Forgiveness leads to renewed relationships, removing all the misunderstandings, removing all the misconceptions that we have. Forgiveness invites us to have a right relationship with God. Yes, dear people of God, the woman who was caught in adultery had an opportunity to renew her relationship, to renew her life, to rethink about her own vocation. Jesus Christ forgave that woman who was caught in adultery and he warned her not to go back to the sin which you have committed. Yes. Dear people of God, forgiveness leads us to have a renewed relationship where Christ invites us to show God's love to the most undeserving person. To the most, you know, undeserving person. Through forgiveness, we show the compassion of God. Through forgiveness, we show the love of God. We, through forgiveness, we show the true face of Christ. If you want to look at cross, whenever you look at cross, you have to remember that Christ has forgiven our sins and we should forgive others. Let God help us in this pursuit of forgiving others. Amen. Let us keep a moment of silence. Thank you. 
because he claimed to be the Messiah and the King of not only Jews but the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But the story unravels to a very, very prominent truth that there were two thieves on either side of Jesus. So I would like to talk a little bit about the commonality and also the difference between those three hanging on the cross. What is common among these three hanging on the cross is that the three are accused and prosecuted as criminals. They are branded as criminals. So Jesus too bore that brand along with the two thieves. But the Bible clearly tells us that there, there is no sin in him. Pilate could not find any fault with him. Herod could not find any wrong in him. Those two people were in authority to take any kind of action and declare Jesus as a wrongdoer. But the Bible says they have not found any wrong in him. But we see here that Jesus was hung on the cross along with the two thieves. The difference between them is that the two thieves were found to be truly criminals. They have done something wrong against the Roman government or probably the society. The punishment was just for them. Even one of the thieves said, we are justly punished and condemned. We are condemned justly. So we deserve it. That's what one of the robbers says. We deserve it. So they did something deserving the punishment. But whereas Jesus was a just person, a righteous, but still he was hung on the cross. The pain endured by the thieves was a result of their misconduct. But pain endured by Jesus was for the sins of the whole world. On every Good Friday, we hear the word excruciating pain. Jesus endured excruciating pain because he bore the sins of the whole world and sins of all kinds. And therefore, Jesus endured the spiritual agony, the physical torment, and also the emotional distress upon the cross of Calvary. But the difference between these two thieves is that one was a reprobate and another a repentant. One said, if you are the savior, then save yourself and save us. It's like the announcement in the flight. First you save yourself in crisis, in danger, put on the mask and then save others. If you are the savior, first save yourself. Let us see it. Then save us. From the words of Jesus, 
we have the assurance of salvation. Probably the thief intently read the inscription upon the cross of Jesus Christ that Jesus is the King of the Jews, that he is the King of the Jews. The kingship of Jesus was expressed in that word and also in the prayer of forgiveness that Jesus offered from the cross of Calvary. Father, forgive them. So this thief saw the divine nature in Jesus and also his in the kingship of Jesus by looking at the inscription on the cross. The thief realized that there was a kingdom far different in its nature from the root from the Roman kingdom or the rule. If Jesus were to be the king, the thief believed that the kingdom that Jesus would bring or inaugurate would be something different from the kingdom of Rome that he and others were experiencing. So thief had faith that the kingdom of Jesus would be different. One thing really, you know, very striking here is that in the midst of pain, violence, anguish, this thief had time to contemplate. He had used the opportunity to express his faith in Jesus. He said, when you come with your kingdom, please remember me. Please remember me in your kingdom. In the midst of pain and agony, at the verge of death, this thief thought about life. He had the hope of new life in Jesus Christ. Dear beloved, Jesus offers salvation when we have lost hope. When we were wandering like the lost sheep, he came down into this world as a good shepherd to seek and save us, to assure us salvation. King David said, I do not rely on the horses and the chariots, but I rely on God. On this very important day in our lives, we must once again shift our attention from depending on the worldly things to God our Savior. The thief was assured of paradise. You know, there are many understandings about the place, whether the souls would rest until the day of resurrection, or what happens in paradise is not known. But what we are interested in is that the salvation was offered instantly, not delayed. And that is why St. Paul says, do not delay. Today is the day of salvation. When you still have the opportunity return with repentance and receive the gift of salvation. The thief had never seen paradise. We are not sure whether he ever heard about it. 
But all that he believed was that Jesus would invite us into his kingdom when we repent and accept him. The assurance of salvation is accompanied by the assurance of kingdom of God. See, when Nicodemus approached Jesus and asked him, how can I enter into the kingdom of God? You know, Jesus gave him a prescription that you must be born again, isn't it? You must be born of water and of fire. You must be born again. When James and John asked Jesus, you know, how can we be on your either sides when you come with your kingdom? Jesus gave a different answer. But here, when the thief said, remember me in your kingdom, Jesus granted him the salvation and also the place in his kingdom instantly. So the message that we have from the cross is that when we repent, we need not wait for a sign to believe that your sins are forgiven. Jesus assures forgiveness of sins and also the gift of salvation. And there are no restrictions for any to be part of God's kingdom. It is for all. Not for a particular tribe or race, but for all. The criminal on the cross who deserved death received the gift of life. And there lies the assurance and hope for us. Once there was a woman who was fully involved in the ministry of God. She spent her time, her resources to talk about the gift of salvation, about the kingdom of God and so on and so forth. For almost 40 years she did it and obviously she grew old and one day one of her friends asked her, dear friend you have done so much for God. You have distributed tracts, you shared the gospel, you have brought many unto God, all that is fine. But what if, what if, due to some reason, you do not find place in kingdom, in heaven, you are rejected. What happens to all that you have done? She said, I will not be the loser, God will be the loser. You know, that was her faith. I will not be the loser, the heaven loses me. Do you think heaven would be ever ready to lose you? The Bible says, there is greater joy in heaven when one sinner returns to God with repentance. Dear beloved, we've been hearing messages after messages. But if this day and this word doesn't inspire us to turn to God, heaven will suddenly lose us. Let us take time to 
re-examine our faith in God, reorder our lives based on the assurance of salvation and his kingdom for all those who believe in him and turn toward him. May the Lord bless us with his words and inspire us to receive the gifts of salvation and his kingdom in our lives now. Amen. I take this opportunity to thank Reverend K. J. Mrs. Victor Ryder for sharing an inspiring and meaningful message with us this morning. And I also would like to welcome Reverend T. Prem Kiran Naigar, Deacon uh, in CSI Western Church. On behalf of all of us, we warmly welcome you into our midst and thank Reverend James C. Naigar for sharing an inspiring message with us this morning. Let us pray. Our Father, we worship you because through Jesus' death and resurrection, we are able to know you personally through faith. Lord, we now invite Jesus Christ to come into our lives to be our personal Savior and Lord. Forgive our sins. We thank you because now we are children of God. Help us to grow in Jesus' likeness by obeying your word and spending time with you every day. Help us to spend the rest of our lives for you and bring glory to you. In the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us continue to praise God by singing the third hymn at the cross, a station here. Let us sing this hymn, the first and the last stanza.
when he looked at Mary, truly when she looks at her son hanging on the cross, it must have reflected what all she thought about Jesus. When Jesus was conceived in her womb and as Jesus was being formed, the excitement that she had, praising God for choosing her, a person who is lowly in the community. And she thanks God specially because this child would be a savior. One has to understand the political context too of that particular time. The Jews, especially in the first century of Palestine, were under the bondage of the Roman Empire. Prior to that, they were tortured by the Greeks, especially by one of their emperors, Antiochus Epiphanes who brought out certain decrees to say that if you find a Jew worshipping, kill them. If you find a Jew reading the Torah, kill them. There was no religious freedom to them. In other words, the Jews were craving for the Messiah who have, they have longed for years to them. And this is happening in the very life of Mary. And the excitement that she has comes to Elizabeth and she narrates the whole thing filled with joy and it is this baby that is going to come into this world who will be saving all of us. Yes, indeed, when she looked at the ministry of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus in every step was a step that was so concerned for the people who had no value in the community till then. The lame were being healed, the sick were being healed, the dying have been raised, the ostracized have been welcomed. No way they thought about this kind of a reality till then. And she saw what was happening through the very life of Jesus. And it is here that indeed she must have experienced tremendous joy in how Jesus is ministering in this world. Yes, every day she must have praised God for who Jesus is. But now, it is a very different scenario. Mary sees her own son hanging on the cross. Many mothers over here. I know how it would feel if somebody said anything to your son. Just imagine if somebody is beating your son in front of you. I'm sure the kind of vigor and the courage that you get, I'm sure nobody can actually fight with you then. But here you are seeing a different kind of a scenario. Where Mary, the mother, instead of being agitated, actually is silent. The silence itself, the silence itself is an indication of supporting the ministry of Jesus even to the extent that he is hanging on the cross. I'm sure no mother can come forward with this kind of a love, especially in the ministry, looking at her own son struggling and dying and still encouraging her son to walk in her in that particular path so that God will be glorified. Mary is silent. The silence speaks about and affirms all her praises all through the years that she said and spoke about Jesus. 
even to the extent that as she looks at her own son, the son is suffering, the son is put to shame, the son is crucified, blood flows from his wounds. In spite of that horrible scenario, she is standing for her son. Not a word of curse, not a word of agitation, nor action from Mother Mary. Dear children of God, on the other side we see Jesus enduring incredible suffering. He has been beaten, he has been whipped, and the whip that was used in those days had sharp bones tied to the end of the leather strips of the whip. And as they used the whip, flesh used to come along with those bones as they hit the victim. She looks at a son who has lost a lot of flesh on the back. He is bleeding profusely and here Jesus stands suffering, suffering the suffering servant. In this incredible pain, even during this pain, he is able to look at his mother. Just in contrary, many of us are sons over here. When you are busy at home or at office, suppose your mother calls you, how would you react? Tell me the truth. It will be very different. Why do you call now? This is the best time for you to call me. I'm so busy, don't trouble me. I'll call you back when I have some free time. You're not in pain. You're just working or you may be busy. But here, a son who is actually dying, who is in full of pain, and struggling to breathe, still has concern towards his mother and looks at his mother. As he looks for sure, he must have seen, it is in this womb I was formed. Through her I received the first nourishment. Her voice taught me language. Her voice taught me the hymns. She told me what is the scripture. She brought me up as a child of God. Indeed, looking at his mother, one of the Greco Roman scholars, Euripides, says, A loving mother is the sweetest thing that we could do, it seems. One of the famous scholars during that particular period of time says, A loving mother is the sweetest you could do. And Jesus looks at his mother. He is still concerned for his mother. He knows that his mother needs support. He knows that somebody needs to take care of her. And then he looks at his disciple who had a special corner for him. This he says, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. He gave Jesus a sense of relief, I am sure. Jesus knows that he is no longer going to be with his mother. He knows his mother needs support. She needs love. She needs somebody to take care of her. And in 
this place, he finds somebody special to take care of. Dear children of God, how does it speak to us this morning? The scripture says, if you hear and do the word of God, you are the family of God. You know this event, the story, when Jesus was with the crowd and the disciples, his family comes to see him. Then he says, who is my family? I'm paraphrasing. Those who do the will of God. The will of God each individual is specially called for in a significant way. And how we respond to that matters a lot. Remember, when Jesus hanging on the cross in that pain could take care of his mother, how much more could he take care of us today? I say this in good faith. Many of us have lost either a father, a mother, a spouse, a sibling, a son, a daughter, a grandchild, a friend, and so on. Those who walk through that phase realize the agony that they walk through. The darkness that is there in front of them. The difficulty to believe in things. Faith is being tested day after day. Somebody who has been so precious to us is no longer with us. This is what the language and the concern of Jesus talks about. When God could take care of him, sorry, Jesus could take care of his mother in that kind of a situation, I'm sure all of us who are facing this kind of realities, if you have the faith, he is there to take care of us. How he would take care, I cannot say. But as the time goes by, I am sure we would have a testimony to say, this is the way that the Lord has taken care of me when I lost my dear ones. Likewise, if you look at our lives once again, all of us in different contexts, in different scenarios, with different experiences have been specially touched by Jesus. And that is why we share one faith. We are all one in Christ and that is the church. We are the body of Christ and here the language talks about, when you talk about the body of Christ, the church, a single mother can find a son. A lonely son can find a mother. A lonely child can find a father. It can go on like this. That is the reason why Christ died on the cross. That his body would be sharing these relationships with whoever is in need and in ease in that dire situations. We need to ask ourselves this morning, 
It is not just ourselves who sit in the congregation today. But the church lives in the society which we always have to realize. The church lives in the society to be concerned for those who have been deprived, those who have been discriminated, those who feel lonely, those who feel ostracized. And it is here the words of Jesus from the cross, Behold your son speaks volumes. Can we stand out and say that Behold, I am there for you as you are going through this kind of a phase. Unfortunately, times are different. Family has become a burden. I'm sorry to use these words. The older you become, entropy is the reality. The more burden you become. Times have changed that the senior person in a house has to be moved to another place so that your immediate family is not affected by that. Many do not hesitate to put their parents in old age homes when they know that they can take care of their own mother, own father at home. I am sorry to say this, but I have seen this in many Christian homes. Your own father becomes a burden, your own mother becomes a burden. When everything is fine for us, when everything is sufficient for us, they become a burden. But when Jesus had nothing, and as he was dying, still he came for his mother. Where do we stand this morning? Let us spend a moment of silence and look to the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father, while suffering on the cross, your son Jesus was concerned about his mother, whose own soul was pierced by a sweat. Help us to be concerned about the needy. We praise you that Jesus Christ is the only Savior and the Lord of all people on earth. We worship you because you want all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. In the name about every other name. Amen. On behalf of the Presbyterian Church, the Dr. Swami Raj Pastor, and also on behalf of the congregation members, I would like to take this time to thank the Dr. K. Suraj Pastor for the first day of the Thank you very much. To prepare ourselves for us into the world, for the that is all the same with him, throw the bomb off her of tree.
the Bible reading of fourth word is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 45 to 49. Matthew, chapter 27, verses 45 to 49. From noon on, darkness came over the world, land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on the stick and gave it to drink. But the others said, Wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to save him. Here ends the reading. Praise be to God. By the words of the mouth and the meditation of all our hearts, be acceptable unto thy sight, her rock and the reading. I thank God for this wonderful opportunity. Lord, I would like to thank Katia, this book in charge, her and Dr. B. Solomon Rajayla, the past committee members, office bearers, and all the congregation members. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? At the very center of the seven words, this word, the fourth word, is probably both Jesus' lowest point as well as a theological high point of crucifixion. Of all seven words of Jesus on the cross of Calvary, this word is very, very special. Because when we look at the entire scenario, what just happened before uttering this word, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When we just look at the Bible and turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 27, verses from 43, 42, when we try to look, then we can see Jesus he was stripped naked. Jesus, he was being mocked by the people, mocked by saying that he saved others, but now he is not able to save himself. Mocked by saying, Jesus, he trusts in God, and let the same God come down and deliver him. Mock him, saying, Oh, save yourself if you are a God. And mock him in many ways. And also, another very interesting thing happened before Jesus said this word. And when it was noon, around midday, darkness came over the whole land. There was complete darkness, total darkness. And at three o'clock, Jesus uttered this word. So therefore, especially focusing upon this very fourth word of Jesus on the cross of Calvary, let us try to bring or let us try to ponder upon the significance of this very word. Why it is so special among all other seven words. The first reason is Jesus uttered this word and this is the first word of Jesus after darkness come out to the whole land. Darkness came onto the land around noon between. And around, when it was three o'clock, Jesus uttered this word. So for almost three hours, there was complete silence and complete darkness. It was complete silent and complete darkness. Why darkness came onto the whole land? 
Why not only we see or the people around the cross were able to see darkness over the land. The first reason, creation which was groaning for the entire, for the liberation of the entire humankind. And when the Creator God is on the cross of Calvary, suffering by Himself to liberate the human, to liberate the entire world, creation could not see the Creator suffering on the cross. It could not tolerate the one who created this creation could not tolerate seeing the Creator God, Jesus Christ, on the cross of Calvary to suffer. Darkness came before Jesus uttering the fourth word. Creator, creation could not see the Creator suffering on the cross. And the second important significance of darkness in the Bible when we see. Darkness, it signifies the wrath of God. God spoke with the people of Israelites when we see when we turn our Bibles to Amos chapter 8, verse 9. It says, On the day, on that day, says the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in the broad daylight. I will allow the sun to go down on that way, which day? On that day where people experience, where people look the very wrath of God. When people have gone astray from God, when people have done things which were not pleasing in the sight of God, in spite of experiencing God's providence, blessings, miracles in life, but still, when people gone away from the Lord, living a life which is pleasing to them, on that day, when God is very much disturbed by looking at the acts and deeds of the people, on that day, I will let the sun to go down in the very own day. It signifies the wrath of God. And the darkness signifies the estrangement, forsakenness, abandonedness. When Jesus uttered this word and before uttering this word there was a complete darkness. Reason? Jesus was totally abandoned by even his Father God Almighty. He was all alone. No one was there with him. Experiencing the great pain, agony, suffering on the cross, all alone. He was totally abandoned or estranged by even his Father God Almighty. And we call this in Greek as enkatalitio, leaving or cutting the relationship abruptly. And Jesus experienced this, being abandoned by his Father. Totally abandoned on the cross of Calvary. Jesus uttered this word before and after the darkness came. And the second important significance of this word is Jesus, over all of all seven words, when it comes to this word, this word, it is a loud cry of Jesus. He not just simply uttered like any other word, but it is a loud cry. And the Markham Gospel, when we see, he used the word to this as wow. Wow, it means it is a loud cry of Jesus, crying, O oh Lord, why have you left me all alone? I'm in deep pain. I'm not able to tolerate the pain, the suffering, what I'm going through, and in midst such suffering, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
with great hope and faith. I believe that you will be with me, but in my weakness, in my pain, in my agony, instead of being as my strength, my God, why have you left me all alone? I'm suffering all alone on the cross. I'm not able to take the pain and agony what I'm going through. My Lord, why have you forsaken me? And the third important significance of this word is, this is the only word of all seven words. Jesus spoke in his own vernacular language, in Aramaic language. No other word Jesus spoke in Aramaic. But this word Jesus spoke in Arabic reason, it shows the pain of Christ on the cross. When someone hits you, or when you go through any pain which you are not able to tolerate, even then we won't, you won't speak in language which is not your mother tongue. When you are in pain, automatically subconsciously you will speak or you will ex express your pain in your mother tongue. You all know it very well. If it is Telugu, if someone hits you, in a subconscious mind you say, Amma. And here Jesus has said this word in his own vernacular language. It signifies that he is in deep pain. And finally, this word, the significance of this word, when Jesus, and this is the first and the last time in Jesus' entire life, he addressed God, Jesus, his Father, as God. My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? No other time in his ministry, he addressed his Father as God. Even on the very first day, first word of cross, he addressed his father as father Abba. Even on the last word of the cross, he addressed God as father. But when it comes to this word, when he was in deep pain, when he lost the very intimate bond and relationship with God, his father, no more he addressed God as father. But God, after losing the very great connection with his father, has said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And when it comes to from the perspective of God who forsaken Jesus, why did actually God leave Jesus on the cross? What made God to leave his begotten son on the cross? Why? He loves his son so much. And also Jesus was very much in faith that his father will not leave him alone. But why actually God left his son? God wants to prove his love towards the entire humankind. And for such reason, and for that reason, God needs to leave his son. God needs to abandon his son in order to give you the life eternal, in order to bore your sins on the cross, in order to give you a life free of sin, in order to deliver you, in order to give you the gift of life eternal and righteous life, in order to heal you. God needs to lay his son alone. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. In order that we may live a life free of sin, we may receive the gift of eternal life. We all may be healed from our wounds, from our sickness, from our agony. God needs to leave his son. 
and God wants to prove his love towards you and towards me by abandoning his begotten son. That's the reason why God left. And the second reason why God actually left or abandoned or forsaken his begotten son is because that is the very will of God. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 10 it says, Yet it is the will of God, will of the Lord, to crush Jesus with pain. Why, God, why did God lift? Why, why did God leave his son, forsaken his son, abandon his son? Or what by actually this estrangement happened? This is the will of God. For that reason, Jesus Christ has come down into this world. For that reason, Jesus suffered. For that reason, Jesus laid his life on the cross of Calvary. And for that reason, Jesus experienced this estrangement on the cross of Calvary. Being abandoned, being all alone, feeling lonely, not being supported or being loved by anyone on the cross. Because this is the very will of God. And the third most important thing, why actually God left Jesus alone on the cross? Because Jesus, he became sin for us. Jesus himself became a sin to redeem all of us. When we look 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 2. For our sins, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Who knew no sin, but for our sake, Jesus Christ had become sin. When he was on the cross of Calvary, he was not just being burdened by the very wood of that cross, but also all our burdens, sins, were upon his shoulders. And for that reason, Jesus not able to look at his son. Even though there is no sin found in Jesus, for our sake, to liberate us, to deliver us, to give us a gift for the life eternal, Jesus himself became sin and laid his life on the cross of Calvary. When we see when we turn our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2, it says, Rather your iniquities have been barriers between you and God. And our iniquities had become a barrier between Jesus Christ and between God. And for that reason, God forsaken his son. Even though Jesus, there is no sin found in him, he became a sin for us. And when he became a sin, there comes a barrier between God and between Jesus. And for, for that reason, Jesus experienced this estrangement. And that is what Martin Luther calls God forsaking God. God abandoning God. God leaving God all alone. And today, dearly beloved, even if you are in such situation, where you're experiencing abandonment, experiencing estrangement, when you pray, if your prayers are not answered many times, just like how Psalmist said in the Messianic Psalm, in Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the same way, many times, even we might have said the same word. When we are sick, when we are praying hours together, days together, but still when we are not experiencing God's healing in our life, when we, we might have said, why God is silent? When we are praying for something which is very much needed to us, when God is not answering our prayers, we might have said, why God is silent. When we are about to leave our bodies, when we are so much depressed, we might have said, why Lord? 
in my problem, in my weakness, in my crisis, why have you forsaken me? For past one, one and a half month, even I was experiencing the same thing. Maybe for that reason, God has given me this word. I was a little sick. I was into anxiety without my knowledge. Out of my subconscious mind, I was going into anxiety neurosis. I was experiencing palpitations. I was experiencing subconscious fear in my mind. I was not knowing what is happening to my body. Even to go out, I was not able to go alone. I was very much scared, not knowing what is happening to me. I have diagnosed, I have, I have gone through all investigations, all are normal, but still I was very much in fear, not knowing what is happening to me in my subconscious mind, anxiety. Then I said, Lord, why have you forsaken me? I'm being abandoned, not able to experience your presence in my life. Why, Lord, why did you leave me all alone? I'm praying you, I'm coming to your feet. But no, Lord, why did you leave me? For my being myself, just for a few minutes, for a few days, for little anxiety when I experienced that God left me all alone in this world. Imagine Jesus Christ on the cross. Blood is shedding from his body. All being all, almost dehydrated, about to die, and in such situation, my Lord, my God, why have you forsaken me? Dear beloved church, if, an, if you are in such situation, not able to experience God's presence with you in your crisis, not able to experience in God being with you in your sickness. Not able to experience that God, the one who promised who is always with you in all situations and not experiencing God being with you. Today God is speaking with you. It says in Isaiah chapter 54 verse 7, For a brief moment I abandoned you. But with great compassion, I will gather. This is a promise what God is giving us. If you are experiencing just like how Jesus experienced that estrangement, being abandoned, being left all alone, in pain and agony, even if you are experiencing in your family, in your personal life, in the society, God is speaking with you. Yes. I might have left you for a brief moment, but remember, I will gather you back. I will take you back. I will take you back into my arms with great compassion because I'm the one who promised you that I will not leave you more for sick. In midst of your crisis, in midst of your deep pain, agony, sorrow, sickness, wherever you go, this is my promise that I will be with you in all your endeavors, in all your journeys and circumstances. This is the promise of God. And the God who was with Jesus Christ, even though he left him, but Jesus never left his people. Even though God left Jesus' hand, Jesus was still holding your hand and my hand. And with that great assurance, let us move forward with a great faith and hope in our heart that Jesus Christ, who is there with us, holding our hands, leading us and guiding us wherever we go. May the God Almighty be with us, strengthen us, especially when we are weak, especially when we are feeling low, especially when we are depressed, especially when we are oppressed by the hegemonic structures of the society. May God Almighty be with us and help us.
Let us all be ready. Our Father in heaven, Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In obedience to your will, he bore on himself our sins on the cross. Though he was without sin, he became sin for us on the cross. And he lost his fellowship with you for some time. Help me to confess my sins and forsake them. May we always remain in fellowship with you and serve you. Amen. On behalf of the Presbyterian Church, Reverend Dr. Solomon, the Pastor Committee, the Congregation, I especially thank Reverend J. Rahul Edward for his meaningful and powerful message. May God continue to bless you as you serve him. As we prepare ourselves for the fifth floor, let us sing the hymn printed on page 8, the first and the last stanza.
St. John's 19, verse 28. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, Order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirst. we have it in two words but in Greek it is only one. The word has many overtones from a prophetic fulfillment to a physical reality and a symbolic situation. We see a prophetic fulfillment where John prefaces this cry of Jesus with these words knowing that all was now completed and that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. And in saying this, Jesus fulfills prophecy that you see in Psalms 22 verse 15. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth and you lay me in the dust of death. Then Psalms 69, 21, they put gall in my food and gave, my, gave me vinegar for my thirst. From a physical side of it, we see one of the side effects of crucifixion contributed to the torture and the torture would bring no doubt a lot of thirst. There are various reasons, not least of which was the form of loss of blood. This was compounded by extreme sweating when one is in pain and also when Jesus was struggling to breathe while being hanging on the cross. He's hanging just based on nails to his hands and to his feet. And the weight of the body used to pull down in such a way that cramps, pain used to exaggerate at the hands and when he wanted to try to lessen the pain over there, he had to put the weight on his feet, which gave a sense of shattering his feet. It is in this scenario that you see that a human being thirsts. Also the time is a noonday. You know for sure the kind of weather that we experience these days. And just imagine somebody being tortured in the noonday heat. This was further compounded by a kind of a burning feverishness. And the crucifixion led to possibilities of infection. And when Jesus said, I thirst, there were those over there who offered him wine vinegar using sponge and hyssop. 
Now all of us who are so concerned about Jesus would be raising a big question. Did they not have a heart to give him some water? Wine vinegar or sauce in Greek didn't have actually any alcohol left. It is a kind of a sour wine that slowly turns to vinegar. On the other hand, wine which is made from grape juice through yeast fermentation, sugar, dealings and other things would finally give you some kind of an alcohol, alcohol content over there. But when it comes to wine vinegar, this is nothing but an action of acetic acid bacteria that actually forms a kind of a liquid a drink that has no alcohol in it. And our big question would be, then why was this container of wine vinegar at Golgotha? It's actually called Posca, a popular drink with the soldiers in the Roman army. It is a diluted wine vinegar with water. It was inexpensive, considered more thirst quenching than water alone and it prevented dehydration and other alignment elements. It killed the harmful bacteria in the water and the water or the wine vinegar was sort of okay to drink in that hot seasons. In other words, the soldier's favorite drink in that heat was the Posca and obviously that is the one that they were carrying at Golgotha. And one of the soldiers used sponge. Sponge is one that belongs to a Roman soldier's kit. They used to tie it to their helmet and the soldiers themselves used this sponge to drink whenever there was a situation like that. So Jesus is actually thirsty and the kind of situation that he is suffering in, the kind of pain that he is enduring, the kind of a physical reality that he is going through, obviously thirst is common over there and as he calls forth saying that I am thirst, one of them happens to offer this wine vinegar to him. Many of us try and tend to read it as an act of mercy and some of us tend to see it as a mockery. And nevertheless, this is offered to Jesus. And as this is offered to Jesus, we continue to see the prophetic fulfillments and the great symbolic understandings that go with these kinds of words. If you look at verse 29 that has been read out, it is, we see the use of a stalk of hyssop plant on which, on which to lift the sponge to Jesus' lips gives a great prophetic significance. If you look at Psalms 51.7, we get the understanding that hyssop was associated with purging of sin. It reads, cleanse me with hyssop and I shall be clean. But the most significant thing over here is the whole prophetic fulfillment and the understanding of the Exodus story in, that you find in Exodus chapter 12 verses 23 where Moses tells the people of Israel to take a bunch of hyssop and paint the blood of the Passover lamb on the top and the side of their main doors. So when the Lord came to strike, they were saved at that given time. Prophetically speaking and symbolically it means that, so the use of hyssop to lift that sponge to the lip of Jesus was another piece of prophetic fulfillment speaking of Jesus becoming the true Passover lamb. 
so with all these overturns one you see a physical consequence you see a prophetic fulfillment on on the other hand you see symbolic significance yes jesus is thirsty but on the other hand the spiritual sense of this is pretty evident as jesus interacts through his the ministry that you find in the gospel according to st john jesus goes out to say that i am the living water if you look at john chapter 4 verses 13 to 14 he says everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again but whoever drinks the water that i gave him will never thirst likewise in john 7 verses 37 to 38 he says this the event is in jerusalem on the last and the greatest day of the feast of passover where he says if anyone is thirsty let him come to me and drink whoever believes in me as the scripture has said streams of living water will flow for him dear children of god how does this word speak to us this afternoon let us remember that jesus has taken upon himself the thirst of all of us we who thirst for the activities of sin and we who are submerged in that today christianity or following christ is being redefined for our own sex we see more of a convenience christianity a consumerist christianity the message that we want to hear should not be pointing at us should not be questioning us but rather a message should be like a massage if we really look at ourselves why is this change happening why does one have to lead in such a way that happens to be distancing oneself from the lord even in christian ministry many are getting too excited with power and authority many are running after money many want the best positions many cannot tolerate the other pride has come in hatred is expressed jealousy is on the face discrimination becomes our witness one is becoming selfish one is becoming corrupt loving is no more it is becoming a distant reality but we say that we are a christian we say that christ has died for us he has quenched our thirst on our behalf he felt that thirst and he died on the cross for us the former president of india dr radha krishnan says i'm sorry to say this word i said that before too christians are ordinary people who make extraordinary claims Christians are ordinary people who make extraordinary claims. Dear children of God, because we are stuck in our sin, Jesus went all the way to the process of crucifixion and became thirst for us. Yes he became son on the cross Jesus took on himself himself that thirst that sinful thirst not just our sinful lives but Jesus has also quenched the thirst of our physical realities 
some of the seniors here could remember that but the past is something that we always have to remember most of our forefathers came from very difficult conditions they were they were thirsty for many realities they were thirsty to fetch water from the village well but that was never a reality for them and as they walked to fetch that water they had to remove their slippers they had to tie a broom behind their back and as they walked the broom symbolically swept their footprints they thirst for education but if anyone was found to be educated or going through a schooling boiling oil was poured into their throats they thirst for medical attention hoping that somebody would touch them and heal them but none were touched they wanted a god they were thirsty for a god they were thirsty to have fellowship with god they were thirsty for the lord's blessings but they were never allowed within the sanctuary it is in these realities that those people then suddenly heard about a different kind of a gospel different words of encouragement different words of hope hope that could quench their thirst there is a savior who would like to love you there is a savior just for you there is a god for you there is a god to take you as you are there is a god to love you there is a god to show you concern till then they rarely had this opportunity there was nobody to touch them but then suddenly missionary hospitals came into being suddenly they felt the touch the touch of christ that brought healing they experienced the greatest gift of education their thirst was quenched they had no identity but today many of us have an identity dear children of god let us not forget the past how we too said i thirst and in that situation how the lord has come through the gospel and quenched our thirst as we today stand out as a church as a witnessing church we do have a responsibility revelation chapter 22 verse 17 says come i start with that word the real words begin whoever is thirsty let him come whoever wishes let him take of the free gift of the water of life and this is what jesus had provided all through his ministry the woman who was suffering with the flow of blood for more than 12 years was thirsty for healing the minute she touched the tunic of jesus her thirst was quenched there were those who were ostracized like zacchaeus there was nobody to fellowship with him but in that context as he was thirsting for fellowship thirsting to be with the community 
Jesus out of the way when everybody is murmuring comes and says I need to come to your house how the lord has quenched the thirst of those in need today as a church as we stand as the body of christ and witness in this society and live in this society we need to realize and recognize those who are still thirsty there are many youth who thirst for jobs there are many girls innocent ones who are thirsting for freedom who have been caught up in human trafficking we are part of a ministry both in calcutta and dimapur that strives for the freedom of girls who are caught up in the trade of human trafficking one of the girls we could provide all the girls alternate training skill training programs and when we heard from the girls they used to say if we leave we have nothing to depend on to survive but today because of this trade we can slowly move out one girl when back she sort of ran away to her place and she is living a life of freedom there are many who are thirsty like this there are many who are thirsty for a family many who are thirsty for a church fellowship many who are thirsty for love many who are thirsty to be cared many are thirsty to be concerned many are sitting here who thirst but nobody is looking at them dear children of god i'm sure after our service many of us have the habit of shooting out as soon as possible because it is so hot over here but do we see that in this humid and hot conditions symbolically speaking there could be somebody sitting in the pews in the corner waiting for their thirst to be quenched christians have an attitude as long as me and my family are blessed that is more than enough but the example or the gospel of jesus says salvation is never in isolation salvation is always in a community when a church responds together the body of christ moves together acts together not just to quench their own thirst but also to see those who are outside and seeking for their thirst to be quenched jesus experienced this quench purely because of our sins he took upon himself on our behalf our sins as he thirst he quenched our thirst and today we are called children of god as children of god the church it is our witness our obligation to seek and find and quench those who are thirsty may the good god be with us and bless us Thirsty, 
Let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within me. May we be filled with the Holy Spirit and the word of Christ so that many people may come to know Jesus personally and enjoy him forever. In Jesus' name, Amen. As we prepare to listen and meditate on the sixth word, let us sing the hymn as printed in page 9 and 10.
Bible reading for the sixth word has been taken from John chapter 19, verses 29 to 30. John chapter 19, verses 29 to 30. Jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of his hip and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed down his head and gave up his spirit. Here is the scripture. Praise be to God. God and Church. First and foremost, I would like to thank God for the privilege and honor God has given me to share sixth word with you this afternoon. This is one of the historic churches I am standing here for the first time. For the ages, it has been a tall witness of resurrection power in this vicinity and also elsewhere in Twin Cities. I really praise God for the wonderful way that this church has been used in the mighty hands of God for His glory. And I want to thank Presbyterian Church, Reverend Dr. Salmur Azegar, and also Siraj, Reverend Siraj, who is leading the service right now. And also bring greetings from my church in Bimethil Church. I also thank Brother Chitpali Daniel Anna, who accompanied with me from my church. Okay. Sixth verse says, it is finished. It is not a feeble voice, but it is a victorious roar. Jesus was shouting with joy and he said, it's finished. The mission with which I have come into this world, with purpose, with what purpose I have come into this world, I have accomplished it. Dear people of God, Jesus said on the cross, this was a glorious moment on his, in his life on this planet earth. Jesus said, I have finished. What exactly is finished? That is the question we need to ponder this afternoon. And he summed up a single line saying, I have finished it. He came into this world with a great mission to accomplish that mission. He concentrated 24 by 7 in his 33 and a half years life. He was all the time focused and he was walking in, the, in that direction. It was not an accident. It did not happen just like that. It is not the Roman soldiers who crucified God, but it is the divine plan. It is the divine calendar that God the Father has designed his son to die in your place, in my place, in order to redeem us. That was the plan and that was the package of God. He was on a mission to re-establish the relationship which was lost because of sin. How sin came into this world because of disobedience. Jesus, God said to the first, very first family in that garden, he said, don't eat that fruit. Because of their disobedience, because of their disobedience, sin entered into human society. Because of sin, death also entered into human societies. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 says, The wages of sin is death. Dear people of God, we need to understand, our decisions in life carry the consequences of the future. Adam and Eve never thought the consequences of their decision. How many times we are taking decision just carelessly, just like that, just for the sake of fun, we take life for granted and we think that we are eternal beings on this planet earth. But this afternoon, God is reminding us one careless decision, one careless behavior, one disobedient brought the creator of God in human form to die for you and me. God is holy, he cannot accept sin. Because his holy cannot accept sin and sin has no place in his presence. At the same time, he has one more side of his nature that is his loving. Because he is loving, he, don't, he doesn't want his child to die in sin. That's why he has designed a plan. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, if you see, God has a plan to redeem this man who has fallen because of disobedience. God, on that day, he decided to send his son in an appropriate time and save this humanity from their helpless situation. 
he promised to send his son to save mankind from their helpless situation jesus came into this world not to establish a religion jesus came into this world not to have a group of people jesus came into this world not to do some kind of miracles but jesus came into this world with a whole and only one mission that is to die on the cross and redeem you and me from the clutches of sin and bondage of death Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 says he came into this world to seek and save that which was lost when jesus came into this world it was not in an easy way situation from the day one he was haunted from the day one enemy wanted to destroy him from the day one he received criticism he had innumerable hurdles and opposition he faced a lot of criticism accusations from the all corners of the society unfortunately even from the religious heads but he never lost his vision he never lost his goal he never deviated from his direction he was all the time on the mission dear people of god when he was born if you look at his birth even at his birth enemy wanted to destroy him he has faced all kinds of situations all kinds of humiliations innumerable problems in his life but he never deviated from the direction dear people of god on 17th chapter of john he prays a prayer and he is giving an account to the father and saying i have glorified you and i have accomplished the mission which which with which you have sent me into this world and i've glorified you and he is giving the report to the father at the age of 12 and when he was there in jerusalem his parents was asking where were you and he's reminding them with what mission he came into this world at the age of 12 do you know why you are existing on this planet earth bible says epistle of first peter chapter 2 and verse 9 he has brought us out of the darkness to shine as stars in this world give life to lifeless people live a glorious shining life for the glory of god dear people of god christian life has got a value you and i are sitting here a victorious people we are called out of darkness to shine in this dark world as the witnesses of jesus christ and we have a purpose and we we need to focus on that goal and we have to walk in the direction all the time not complaining about the situation and circumstances and crying to god lord why you have kept me in this kind of situation i am not able to bear this situation unfortunately many people cry to god and say lord remove this kind of situation Jesus from the day one when he came into this world he had all kinds of problems all kinds of opposition all kinds of you know challenges in front of him but in every situation he was all the time focused on the goal at the age of 12 he was talking to the sadducees and priests and chief priests and he was very much aware why he came into this world do you know why you were saved Do you know why you are living why you are sent into this 21st century why you are placed in this church why you are placed in telangana why you are placed in hyderabad do you ever thought on these grounds because there is a plan it is not an accident my friend bible says in psalm 139 and verse 16 all the days of our life are numbered and we are here with a plan and purpose of god to accomplish his plan and purpose jesus came into this world and he has accomplished his purpose what god has given to him he was focused he was determined to reach the goal when circumstances force him he never yielded to the at any point of time he never yielded to the circumstances let not the situations and circumstances define us but purpose and passion let not the circumstances let not the political pressure let not the poverty let not the pain let not anything in this world define us except the passion and purpose for which we have been saved jesus was very clear from the day one why he came into this world and he was all the time focused and he was all the time walking in the direction with 100% human body he accomplished what was expected from him many times we complain saying that we are humans it is not 
possible to live like Jesus Christ. I tell you, my friend, I tell you, it is possible to live like Jesus. With 100% human body, Jesus lived a sinless life with the power of the Holy Spirit. When you invite Holy Spirit into your life, you will not live an ordinary uh, exhibition Christian life, but you will have extraordinary power in your life. People will amaze at you. When people look at you, when people witness your life, they will be amazed at your quality of life and the power with which you are overcoming sin and the world. If you wanted to see such kind of focused life, you need to ask God to help you and lead you like Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ being the creator of the whole universe for you and me to follow his beautiful example. He was praying all the time. Without prayer, you will enter into temptation. Without prayer, you will fall. Without prayer, you will live a powerless Christian life. Many Christians for, ta for prayer and word of God, we have limited time. That's why our life is a mechanical life. That's why we are not able to to make any impact in this world though the Christianity came into this world long back centuries back in the first century itself we have received the gospel of Christ but when we look at the statistics because we are living a focusless life goalless life aimless life we are just living as missions this is the time we need to question ourselves. This is the time we need to ask what are our priorities. Jesus had a priority to come into this world that is to die and save all the human race from their helpless situation what all he finished on the cross every commandment of the law of the lord had been fulfilled the second he finished the redemption work third he finished the work of the restoration and relations which was lost because of sin between man and god he, he restored it he destroyed the Satan and all his powers and he has destroyed a death on the cross. Dear people of God, Jesus came into this world with great plan and great purpose. Today we call it as a good Friday. It is not a sad Friday. Unfortunately, many people live very sadly because they don't know the power behind it. It is a celebration Sunday. You and I are enjoying this freedom. You and I are having a hope. If we close our eyes, we have a beautiful hope in Jesus Christ. Because of this day, because of this event, because of this beautiful, beautiful day in the history of humanity. Enemy try to give us so many stories telling that living a life focused is very, very important. We have to live a life which is focused on Jesus Christ. Dear people of God, Paul says in his second epistle to Timothy, in last days, what would be the situation of the societies? What would be the condition of the believer? What would be the condition that will prevail in the churches? After going home, please read chapter 4 and verses beginning from 1 onwards and he says that young Timothy he was warning because he was a spiritual father to young Timothy and he says in last days people become the lovers of themselves they want uh, pleasure not pain they, they will live for their own selfish ends not to accomplish the purpose of God and he was warning he was encouraging young Timothy follow my example once I was a blind man I was living in a ritualistic Christian life I was doing all kinds of uh, religious uh, uh, formalities but when Jesus Christ met me on the way when I received Jesus Christ when I was anointed by the Holy spirit my priorities have changed my goals have changed my purpose has changed my focus has changed and I am li I lived my life with great purpose and I have conquered all the battles spiritual battles and I have kept my faith and I have run my race faithfully and I have a great and blessed hope can you say that can you say that this morning this afternoon Dear people of God, Christian life is full of challenges. Christian life is full of uh, uh, uncertainties. But in all those situations, we have a blessed hope in Lord Jesus Christ. Because he lived out word and he was fulfilling the plan and purpose of God through his life. Then what about you? This afternoon, God is quietly whispering. Have you ever realized what is your role and responsibility? why god is existing why god is allowing us to exist in this world why god is extending our stay on the planet earth why we are living for some people 
church means a social status for some people church means a recognition for some people church means only property for some people church means only positions for some people church means entertainment dear people of god jesus came into this world to die that heinous death in order to redeem the human race from that bondage of sin bondage of death and to give eternal hope many people outside they don't have this hope but we have a blessed hope because jesus never even for a fraction of sec second deviated from his goal all the time he was focused all the time he was focused and he said can any one of you blame me can any one of you put a blame on me or show a sin in my life can you say that Paul who imitated Jesus Christ he says in first epistle first letter to Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1 he says I imitated Christ imitate me as a church elder as a deacon as a pastor as a believer of Christ can you say to your children and friends I imitate Christ imitate me can you speak the gospel of Christ through your life through your testimony if that is not the case I encourage you to examine your hearts. If that is the case, glorify God and live out till the last breath for the purpose to accomplish his glorious and divine will. Dear people of God, Jesus was focused and he reached the goal. Then what about you? May God give us that grace to imitate Christ and finish the work which God has entrusted to us. Jesus has finished the work and he has given salvation as a free gift to everyone who believes in that beautiful sacrifice. Jesus' death, burial and resurrection is not a coincidence. It is predetermined. It is the divine plan and purpose. No human killed him, but he himself laid his life because he's focused. He glorified God. He honored God with his body. He honored God with his life. He obeyed every command of the Lord and he lived out the word of God through his life. May God give us that kind of focused life to accomplish at the end of our life if we can also say yes lord i have finished everything that have you entrusted in my life and glorified you may god bless you thank you Let us pray. Our eternal Father, we worship you for Jesus completed his great work of salvation and redemption for all people. Let us fix our eyes on him, the author and the people of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. We praise you for our salvation which is by grace through faith. Since Jesus is victorious, we as people are able to lead victorious lives. Help us to complete the work for which you have kept us in this world. May we as a church spread the good news of Jesus everywhere. Amen. The Presbyterian Church, Reverend Dr. Solomon Iger, Pastor Committee and the Congregation. We thank Reverend Zafania David. Let us all rise and sing the hymn that is found at page 11. O sacred and surrounded. Page
charge reverend dr p salomon raj ayagaru the pastor secretary the pastor treasurer pastor steward the committee members and all of you for giving me this opportunity to stand before you and share the seventh word which was spoken by the lord jesus christ on the cross father into thy hands i come and my spirit let us pray gracious lord heavenly father thank you once again for giving us this wonderful day to thank you from the bottom of our hearts that 2000 years ago you have laid your life for the salvation of the humanity lord as your children remembering your sacrifice on this day and the seven valuable words which you have spoken from the cross lord we look to you lord i humble servant cover me under your mighty hands let the words of my mouth 
and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. This is the seventh and the last words spoken by Lord Jesus Christ from the cross of Calvary. We have been meditating on the last six words and God has been talking to us in different ways to each and every one of us this afternoon. And the Lord Jesus he has been suffering since last night. He has been pierced on his head. The Roman soldiers were mocking him and he has been carrying the cross to the Golgotha while the Roman soldiers were beating him. His body is turned apart and still, still, even at the time of his death, he has given us seven valuable words for which we need to contemplate every day in our lives. And this seventh word, he's speaking to the Lord, God Almighty, the Father. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. As we look in the book of Genesis, the life which is given as human beings is from the Lord. We are being made in his own image. He made us with the clay and he has given his spirit to us by blowing into our nostrils and we are called humans. Since the day one, the spirit which is within us is given by the Lord Almighty. We did not have any power over our lives because our lives belong to the Creator. Nowadays, we look at the news, the newspapers that people suiciding, taking their own decisions. We do not know after their death, where does the Spirit go? Because the Spirit is given by the Lord, and it is our foremost duty that we need to hand over our souls and spirits to the Lord. Here, Jesus Christ was born in this world as an ordinary human being. Throughout his life, he has shown us an example how a human being can be in spite of trials, temptations, pains, sufferings. How can we be loyal to God? He has shown us an example. From his childhood days, from the time of his birth, we see how Lord Jesus was brought up by his parents, how he was loyal to his worldly, earthly parents, and what promise he has done and while he, attaining the age of 30, he has taken up the responsibility of the Lord, given by the Lord God Almighty, the mission for the salvation of humankind. My dear friends, here on the cross, from the cross, he has forgiven. He has given a promise to the thief that today you will be with me in paradise. 
he has fulfilled the responsibility of his earthly mother and he is talking to the lord he is talking to the lord why have you forsaken me i thirst and it is finished and at the time of his final breath he is commending his spirit to the lord god almighty saying that he has come into this world and fulfill all the commandments by the lord god almighty the father in heaven and is handing his spirit to the lord my dear friends the gift of salvation gift of life is given by heavenly father to us and here in this world taking up his own image in us by accepting him as our lord and savior we are in this world to serve him we are in this world to set an example we are in this world to take up the cross and follow him jesus christ has set us an example to us in this world how we need to talk how we need to live how we need to show the compassion how we need to show uh, uh, how we need to forgive our fellow beings how we need to forgive our enemies he has set an example even at the time of death he is talking to the father he said i have accomplished and now i commit myself i commend my spirit unto thy hands and this afternoon looking at the cross looking at the lord jesus christ who suffering on the cross 2000 years ago we need to reexamine our lives we need to reexamine ourselves are we living like jesus christ who has set as an example to us or are we living our lives on our own if you are living the lives of our own my friends we need to rededicate ourselves on this good friday we need to rededicate ourselves and walk like jesus christ love your neighbor as thyself said jesus christ for saying it is very easy but when in practicality it's very hard for us to love our neighbor god so loved the world in spite he knowing that judas iscariot will betray him in spite of knowing that the roman soldiers will persecute him knowing that he will be crucified on the cross knowing that the judgment will be given by pilate lord jesus he loved the world there are people who hated him there are people who plotted against him there were people who mocked at him but still jesus christ did not utter a word he committed himself for the mission for what he has come into this world he fulfilled the mission and what is our mission today what is the mission today as children of god our mission is to take this salvation into this world the salvation which you i and all of us have received we need to share it with our friends we need to share with our relatives we need to share with those who did not hear the word of jesus christ till today we are in a comfort zone my friends we are not called to be in the comfort zone we are called to take up the cross and follow jesus christ 
Are we really taking up our cross? Are we really obeying the commandment which the Lord God, Jesus Christ, has left to us? Today, we need to examine ourselves. Today, we need to rededicate ourselves. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Today is a time of salvation. Today is a time to rededicate ourselves. Today, we need to look at Lord Jesus on the cross, the seven words which he has spoken, which are very valuable in our lives. May the good Lord help us to rededicate ourselves for the cause which he has left unto, unto us. Let the trying God help us and empower us in taking up the cross in this world. Amen. Now let us continue to praise God by singing hymn number 
the last hymn, My Song is Love Unknown, during which offerings shall be collected.
number 496, let us continue to praise from the new ones. Lord, 
pray that you would strengthen us as we start a new life looking unto you and looking unto your son our savior christ today lord we pray that you would redeem us from the bondage of sin and slavery and grant us eternal life so that we might dedicate our lives into your hand and lead a redeemed life today lord we also pray for all the preachers who have preached <coughs> wonderful word to us who have inspired us and who have encouraged us to lead a perfect life of humility we also pray for our all our congregation members we pray for our pastorate committee members we pray for our sectional secretary we pray for our choir we pray for our musician we pray for all the people who have helped us in conducting this worship service in a meaningful way lord bless each and every one of us we also pray for the people who are attending this service in online lord we pray that you would bless them and continue to be with them and guide them now lord even as we glorify your name your name and even as we continue to lead our respective lives be with us and guide us in jesus precious name i pray amen our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name is God by singing the last hymn when i survey the wondrous cross
Be 